Hi, I'm Eric Deggins, TV critic for NPR, and I'm here to talk to you about my book, Race Bader, How the Media Wields Dangerous Words to Divide a Nation. Um, there's a cover right there. Um, it's a book basically that talks about how different media outlets, uh, not all uh, certainly, but some, use prejudice and stereotyping and even outright racism to draw audiences to their media platforms and then keep those audiences uh, from going to other places. Um, it's really interesting. It's basically, um, uh, the, the, the framework of the book is that I had um, worked as the TV and media critic for the St. Petersburg Times, now known as the Tampa Bay Times newspaper in Florida, uh, for a good 16 years. And over uh, that period of time, I did a lot of stories where I talked about um, this sort of thing, how prejudice and stereotyping and race issues uh, unfold in the media. And uh, at some point I realized it was worth writing a book about all this stuff I was seeing, about how um, racial issues work in reality television, or how racial issues work in terms of diversity among scripted network television shows, or talk radio, or uh, websites, and uh, the online media world. Uh, but I needed a concept that would sort of unite everything. And uh, fortunately, my good friend Bill O'Reilly came along, um, the principal star on Fox News. He called me a race baiter on his show in 2008. And I'm not quite sure why he called me a race baiter, except um, it was around the time that uh, he was getting a lot of criticism for going to a restaurant in Harlem and marveling that the uh, black people that he saw in this upscale restaurant, uh, you know, weren't acting like rappers and screaming out obscenities and grabbing their crotches. And um, <laughs> he called me one of the biggest race baiters in the country at the end of this long diatribe about how black people can't talk to white people about race anymore uh, because it's, there's too much danger that white people will be called uh, racist. And of course, that's nonsense. Uh, but it was interesting. The one thing he did mention was that um, I'm involved with the National Association of Black Journalists. I serve as uh, uh, president of the uh, Media Monitoring Committee. Um, which recommends to the board um, institutions that should receive their best practices award, which is, of course, uh, institutions that hire, promote, and do a great job of covering issues related to people of color. And then uh, they have a thumbs down award, which, not so coincidentally, Fox News had received uh, before this. So maybe that's why um, he called me one of the biggest race baiters in the country. So I wrote about this for both my newspaper and for the Huffington Post. And I was telling my friends about it. And I was talking to a particular friend who's also uh, a writer. And he said, you know, you should do a book about how when you want to have a real conversation about race and difference, people try to shut you up by calling you a race baiter. And, you know, it was one of those light bulb moments. Uh, and I said to myself, that's the concept that could unite all the different things that I want to talk about in this book. So um, I essentially talk about wanting to redefine the term race baiter. I feel like right now um, the audience has more power than it has ever had in terms of media. People can go on Twitter or social media of some sort, they can complain about a TV show or a TV star, and the next thing you know um, that person may lose endorsements, that person may lose their TV show. Um, they, you know, People, the fans can have a real impact. So I'm thinking one way to stop media outlets uh, from doing what they do is to change the audience and turn the audience uh, into race baiters of a sort. People who are willing to have uncomfortable conversations about race as long as they're fair and as long as they're about coming to some sort of understanding. So uh, the book Race Bader is basically a media literacy book and it's also a race literacy book, right? I have to explain how media works so you have a sense about how these messages are used to make money. And then I also have to talk about how race works so that you have a sense about why the certain messages are selected that are selected and how damaging they are to society. So um, what I tell people whenever I give speeches is that if you want to understand 95% of what happens in media, you just need to understand two things. You need to understand how somebody's making money or somebody's losing money. <laughs> right, uh, money is the root of all evil and the root of just about everything in in in, uh, in media. So um, I spend a lot of time in the book 
explaining, for example, how talk radio works, or explaining, for example, how Fox News works. Fox News is a good example because it's one of the most prominent conservative-oriented media structures out there, and it has a very specific way of talking about race. Fox News, uh, its success is built on reflecting the fears and um, the attitudes and the orientation of its largest audience, um, its target audience in a way. Right, so most of the people who watch Fox News, um, there it's overwhelmingly white. Uh, the audience is older. Um, both Sean Hannity and Bill O'Reilly, two of Fox News's biggest stars, uh, you know, their average, the median age uh, of their viewer is in the high 60s, 68, 69. Right, uh, so the audience is older. The audience is overwhelmingly white. The audience is politically conservative, and it's a little more male uh, than female. So when you understand that and you understand that what they're trying to do is sort of poke at the fears of that audience and then also attract that audience and keep them from going to other places, then you understand why they talk about race the way they do. In the book, I talk about a survey that was done by the Brookings Institution that found, uh, for example, that um, in the average population, about 46% of the people um, believe that the playing field is level in terms of race in America, right? No one has one advantage uh, over the other, and that um, white people are just as likely as people of color to be discriminated against for their race, right? 46%. But when you look at Fox News viewers, people who say they're fans of Fox News, then all of a sudden that total jumps to 70%. Right. So Fox News um, viewers generally don't believe in this idea of institutional racism, that there's something about how the criminal justice system works or about how the education system works or about how the employment system works that inherently makes it harder for people of color than it is um, for uh, for white people. They don't believe that. Right. So uh, the way in which Fox News would handle covering the death of Trayvon Martin, for example, a young unarmed black teen who was shot by a neighborhood watch volunteer while he was uh, somewhere where he had every right to be, you know, there were that case raised a lot of concerns about racial profiling and about whether um, the authorities in Florida moved too slow to prosecute the person who killed him. Uh, but for Fox News, those questions are different because they don't believe in institutional racism and they don't believe uh, that the criminal justice system in general works differently. Uh, for people of color than it does uh, for white people. So once you understand the money-making cycle at hand and how they attract an audience and tell them, you know, look, this vision of the world that we're giving you is the one that's right and you don't believe CNN and don't believe PBS and don't believe Al Jazeera America, you know, we're the ones telling you the truth, then you understand why they talk about uh, the issues the way they talk about them. So. Um, and the book is divided into a lot of different um, subjects. As I said, it's a media literacy book, so I teach you how um, uh, talk radio evolved. I talk about how reality TV evolved. Uh, I talk a little bit about how cable news works. Um, I talk a little bit about how um, uh, online areas work, online uh, advocacy websites like Media Matters or Newsbusters. We talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, so you get a sense about how media works, but then we also talk about how race works. We talk about um, cognitive bias. We talk about um, the tendency for people to uh, look for things that confirm things they already believe in a situation as opposed to uh, trying to look at the evidence and then make conclusions about something later. Um, there's a lot of talk about studies and things. You know, this isn't just my opinion. Uh, I've tried to go out there and find the science that sort of backs up a lot of these um, dynamics that people who study race uh, have discovered over the years. Uh, and at the end of the book, I try to offer a solution. Uh, I try to answer Bill O'Reilly's uh, commentary and talk about how people can talk across race to each other, how you can recognize the propaganda tools that are used to keep us apart, and how you can overcome them. You know, people often say that we live in this media culture where people can get stuck in their own silos. But I also think that uh, the social media culture that we live in now makes it easier for us to connect across big distances. And if you're um, an African-American fan of rock music who loves to get tattoos and is a big fan of Doctor Who, you can find someone like that who may be living in China or may be living uh, in, in, um, in the Ukraine. And you can, trade, you can trade messages with them and it can almost feel like they're, they're in your backyard. So it's all in how you use it and it's all in how where you are of all these different 
forces that are around you. And so if there's a takeaway to the book, um, it would be that media is shaped by all these different values. Uh, every media message has values inherent in it. Uh, you, ha you use that to sort of judge the message, right? I, I start a lot of my talks by showing people a picture of a typical villain from a silent film, and I ask them, uh, you know, you've just seen this picture, it's not moving, I haven't told you anything about it, how do you know this guy's a villain? And they always know he's a villain right away because he's dressed in black, and he's unattractive, and he has a big mustache, and he's you know, uh, crouched over uh, a helpless woman, menacing her. And so right embedded in that image uh, are a lot of clues to the values inherent in that media message, right? That people who wear black are somehow mysterious and somehow shady, and that people who are unattractive are more likely to be villainous, right? There, there's all kinds of value messages inherent in a single photo, let alone uh, the hours and hours of news coverage that we see um, on the cable news outlets or on media websites or on talk radio or, or what have you. So what I'm trying to help people do is dig that stuff up and think about it more directly because it affects you, believe it or not, uh, less if you think about it directly. So um, you can get the book in a lot of different places. You can, um, at Barnes and Nobles uh, across the country have it. You can order it on Amazon. Uh, you can come to my website, which is ericdegans, D-E-G-G-A-N-S dot com. Uh, and uh, there's ways to order it there. You can email me directly uh, at digdog, D-I-G-D-O-G, at AOL dot com. Or you can reach me on Twitter at Deggins, and I'd be happy to help you order a copy as well. It's available uh, in Kindle, and it's available on the Nook. So if you have any further questions, certainly feel free uh, to reach out to me online. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope it told you a little something about how media works, a little something about how race works, and a little something about how race baiting works. Thanks a lot.